Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Beth, the head coach and founder of Ebb and Flow Integrations, also fellow in Lifted Coach. Beth, how are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I was looking forward to this, uh, you know, and we had a good, uh, good opening conversation there, listening to the music. Great to, yeah, always great to, uh, to talk to a fellow coach, a fellow in Lifted Coach specifically. And yeah, I've been looking forward to this. So thank you for uh, for taking the time. I yeah, let's. I want to start off with like ebb and flow integrations. Let's uh, and just everything that you have going on right now. So I know that you're um, getting into the origin story side of Enlifted Level Two, and it looks like you're uh, you're prepping. I know you have a podcast on the go. So there's many many things to talk to you about. So I'll, uh, yeah, like, let's all things Beth. What what do you have going on? Uh, what are the uh, the irons in the fire right now for you? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, lots of moving parts. Um, I am relatively new to the coaching space. Um, I became attuned to Reiki levels one and two at the end of 2020. And um, originally, my intention with that was just to like do some self healing. Um, I had been coming out of a lot of codependent relationships, um, just freshly coming out of uh, substance abuse, like my addiction, and uh, trying to start over. And um, as I began to uh, sit with Reiki and continue to gather in community um, and like just practice regulating my nervous system, I, um, I started to resonate really deeply with the power of Reiki and the power of self-reflection and, and being the observer of your reality. Uh, and I wanted to share that with others in some way. And I had felt called to coaching um, in the past, like a little glimpse of it when I was in uh, um, my outpatient therapy group. Um, I had to go, or I got to go uh, once a week mm -hmm. for a while. And um, the very last meeting was the group session. And my therapist loved working with me and talking to me so much that she asked me to lead some of the activities in the group container. Mm -hmm. And I love doing it. And I loved engaging with people in that way. And um, I was like, maybe I could be a substance abuse counselor myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of like let that thought go. Uh, and yeah, after the program was over, I moved to Milwaukee to start over and kind of just let all that go. Um, and last year in November, no, in 2021 in November, mm -hmm. um, I was like, I'm going to just start my business. You know what? I want to start coaching people. I took a super basic course mm -hmm. and was like, I'm going to do it. So I announced it. I launched it. People were starting to message me. Bam, imposter syndrome. And um, all of these stories came up of my own. And uh, I, I realized there was a lot more work for me to do. Right. And um, my passion for service continued to develop the more that I uh, focused on my own stories and rewiring those stories through connecting with community and finding support outside of myself while I was still recalibrating my internal state. Um, right now, uh, I am in the process of developing different one-on-one -on -one containers uh, with, within my own niche of being supportive to others. Um, I would call myself a integrative um, transformational coach. Like uh, um, I, I feel that my niche is helping people uncover their stories. And then through this lens of unconditional love that I've acquired from Enlifted, or sorry, from Reiki, um, mm -hmm. I've been able to expand that capacity to like hold the darkness that mm -hmm. um, every one of us has in relevance to our more painful experiences and being able to like turn that around and like show people that that light that we all hold, um, that, that finite, infinite light we all mm -hmm. hold. And um, yeah, it's just really fun to join in that container with people and 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 be able to reshape identity through the language and story work, but then also through like just reflecting like back to the people the incredible ways that they have navigated and survived things that they 
may have thought they couldn't. And you know that that passion and that that understanding of the resilience of humans comes from experiencing it myself. Um, mm. Yeah, that was a little tangential. Yeah, that's great. You know, and it's set up perfectly. Uh, you know, you've you've mentioned what you've experienced yourself. That's a perfect point to to go back in time and and do that. I do have a couple quick questions though before we do it. So we'll 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 pause it right there. That's a great way to start. Uh, just from what you what you were talking about, um, I'm just kind of curious what your, you know, like there's like the dictionary definitions of words, and then there's like we have our own spins. Like I have my own spin on certain words and such. I'm thinking specifically for like integration. You know, a lot of people talk about that. What is like an integrate? What is integration to you? What's like an integrative process? And how important is that in your, your style of coaching? Sure. That's a great question. So um, integration to me, it's like going back into the past and maybe even perceiving into the future of where you want to go and bringing them together in the middle into the present and mm -hmm. seeing how each piece has an impact on how you will move forward. Um, our past experiences can have such a hold on us. And um, I find that when we take that space to look at it non-judgmentally and create a space for it to exist, we're able to then like transform it, release it, and bring ourselves back to like what is currently happening, what is currently true for me, um, and how am I going to utilize that um, integration of what I've experienced in my past in my forward stepping into my future and what I want to create. Um, I'm very passionate about presence and presence practices. And I feel that um, a lot of us have these voices in our head that are telling us these stories of like, our victimhood or our not good enoughness or, you know, this, this pressure we're always putting on ourselves to be perfect, to be good enough. And, um, a lot of those voices and stories come from things we've experienced in the past. And when we can quiet those voices down and just like tune into what's true right now, we're able to move forward with so much more lightness and so much more, um, just abundance. And, uh, yeah, so the integration aspect of ebb and flow integrations shines a light on that awareness that we we do have a past and that that is just as much who we are as is what we are right now in this now moment. Mm. But there's ways to turn those experiences into something completely new. We have that power. Um, and it like brings me to the point of like, you know, trauma and the impact it has on our, our physical state and like when certain things happen to us, when we are the victim in some scenario, whether that be sexual assault or an abusive relationship or whatever the case may be, we are the victim in that moment, in that instance. Mm -hmm. The problem or the opportunity is <laughs> um, in recognizing that, um, you know, throughout our lives after the, the event, we continue to identify with that, with being the victim. And we're constantly like looking for in our external environment, where, like, where am I the victim? Like, who's going to hurt me next? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how am I going, what dangers are going to come in next? Um, and the more we identify with it, the more it, it like, it, we're attracting it. So yes, we may have been the victim of some great pain as far as being violated in in whatever capacity but when we can identify that and recognize you know in our bodies and in our minds that the threat has passed and we get to create a new story of like safety internally first we're able to then expand that outward and like just create a new reality we get to interact with our reality differently when we're not constantly subconsciously looking for uh, ways that we're going to be victimized next. Mm. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I love it. That's great. Uh, the second one is like, I, so the work that the, you know, the self-development work, um, that I've been doing on myself, I have a, a very different perspective of like darkness, right. Or shadow work and such, where it was like, yeah, definitely a pattern of mine previous with like substance abuse, uh, specifically alcoholism, I would def definitely that would show up when there would be uh, feelings that I perceived as 
you know, definitely uncomfortable or the darker feelings or negative feelings, right? This like idea that there's a, like a hierarchy to emotions, right? And, and some of like loneliness or sadness or, you know, shame and such uh, are ones that I don't want to feel or was choosing not to feel. And I would shut off with, I have such a d different perspective on, on darkness now. Um, I'm just curious to see, because you mentioned the word darkness. I'm just curious what your perspective is on it through uh, your, you know, healing journey and the way that you approach others and the way that they're seen uh, or perhaps not even aware of their, their darkness, if you will. Sure. When I think of my darkness personally and how it still will arise, um, I think of um, the absence of the felt experience of a, like my aliveness, like um, darkness to me is like that, that fear state, that uncertainty, not knowingness. And um, in, in my own experience with addiction, um, that's where I was for the majority of it. Internally, I was um, in avoidance of anything that resembled too closely aliveness. I was subconsciously mm. avoiding true aliveness because uh, it was scary to me. It was unsafe. It was like, if I feel into my aliveness, I'm going to be violated again. So I would turn to substances to numb out any like true feeling or like experience of like even love. Like I, I, that was so foreign to me that it felt dangerous. So um, yeah, when when darkness arises for me, it's, it's usually has a place within that, like, um, not being able to attach to like truth or, or that feeling of real true liveness. And that's something that I just now recently am even, I feel like fully experiencing it mm -hmm. in, in aliveness. Um, yeah. and I find that that when I look at my addiction, if I were to like numb, dumb it down to one sentence, it would be, the avoidance of my aliveness and the avoidance mm. of true connection. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's okay. Perfect. It, it seems like we've come back to a, a perfect spot to, uh, to segue back into like an origin story. Like there's been some foreshadowing, you know, you've met, you have mentioned that there is a recovery journey and a recovery story of yourself. So I'd love to give you the open floor just to take your time and go back as far as, uh, you know, as you care to go and just let us know what, made Beth the Beth that we're seeing and hearing from today did what, what is your origin story and yeah f f feel free to just take your time and, and let us know amazing thank you for introducing me to the origin story mm -hmm. it's perfect um this is what we're doing in lifted right now so, yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so my my experience with addiction begins at a relatively young age I was about 15 when I tried drugs. Um, I had been very against them uh, growing up initially. I was homeschooled until fifth grade, so I was very sheltered mm. growing up. And there was a lack of conversation around, I mean, I mean everything, uh, like, like sex, you know, money, all of the things. We just didn't talk about it. And if we did, there was shame around it at home. So um, what triggered my use was, uh, it was, um, and it's taken me a long time to actually trace this back and recognize that this was the root was the lack of connection. And then my own experiences with uh, sexual assault. So when I was a, a junior in high school, I lost my virginity non-consensually. And throughout the rest of my experience in high school, the same guy um, sexually assaulted me a few more times. And it was like always just like these scenarios where I was at a party getting too drunk. And um, the first time it happened, that's when I kind of spiraled. Uh, and I didn't realize it. I didn't even know what had happened was not okay because there was no talk about it. You know, there was no conversation about it, about like sex and like how to set boundaries, how to communicate, how to even enter that space. It was just like something I knew that people did. I wanted to get it out of the way. And then once I was actually in a space with a man, it was like, I didn't want to do it. You know, I was like, this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And he proceeded. And so I found the wrong group of friends pretty quickly after that. People who were also in avoidance of some pain, I'm sure. And um, they introduced me to cannabis and cigarettes. Um, I've actually been a smoker since I was 15. 
Um, April 1st, I'm doing a month with no nicotine and I'm going to yeah. see what happens after that. Yeah. But um, yeah, it pretty quickly turned into alcohol. And it's interesting to think back, like, you know, I didn't feel comfortable talking about what I had experienced with this man. Um, and I didn't feel comfortable talking about much of anything that I was experiencing emotionally. Um, I was like diagnosed with depression and anxiety prior. And um, my mother, who I love so much, but she was very invalidating of my emotional experience. She would say, you know, it's an attitude problem or like uh, she would take me to the doctor and I would just keep trying different um, antidepressants. And I didn't want to take them. And um, I just wanted to understand what I was experiencing, but I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody. So that inevitably turned into using substances to try to numb and suppress these feelings. Although I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time. So yeah, throughout my junior and senior year of high school, I was drinking a lot. I was drinking every weekend. And um, sometimes even we would have what we would call wine Wednesdays. We'd buy like three boxes of wine. And like the goal was just to get as drunk as possible. And at first it was like fun, you know, it was just like we would be singing and like, you know, just fucking around. Am I allowed to swear on this yes. podcast? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. You're, you're good. <laughs> good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were fucking around. And then yeah. it just turned into just the messiest nights. And um, I actually had had a mushroom experience. And I was taking mushrooms for the wrong reason. But I was about 16. And I ate way too many mushrooms. And I had my first uh, ego death experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that's what it was. Um, yeah. But my my body and my felt state, they were just completely separate. And um I remember at the end of it, I was like, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. I was like, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that didn't last very long. Uh, and when I graduated high school, I was had been in a relationship. I left the relationship and um, I didn't have a plan. You know, I, I didn't have uh, anywhere to really go. And I met this guy and immediately we fell into another relationship. It was like a month after my breakup. And he was uh he was a an, an addict and he like our first date was me going around and selling Adderall with him and taking Adderall at, mm. like for fun and um yeah so um when people ask me what my like addiction was like what my drug of choice was it was all of them like it, it didn't matter to me it was like whatever I could get my hands on and um, we, me and this guy, his name was Alex, we dated for three and a half years and it was the most wild time of my life. It was like, we were constantly fucked up and it was like a benzodiazepines and opiates became my drug of choice. Um, and it's fun or not fun, but it's interesting to recognize, like, you know, I had this identification with my anxiety. I was like, I have anxiety anxiety you know it wasn't like I'm just experiencing this like I understand now it's like mm. this is just who I am and I wanted to numb that and continue to numb that and yeah so for three and a half years me and Alex we were just um barely surviving like uh but never able like we weren't able to keep a job we would we got arrested our first time together uh and we got caught with um like marijuana and some prescription pills. And the reason we got uh, pulled over in the first place was because uh, we had taken benzodiazepines and muscle relaxers together. And like, we're just, I don't even remember getting in the car, you know, and we fell asleep yeah. at a stoplight and mm. he managed to keep his foot on the brake, but somebody had seen us like swerving down the road. And um, yeah, so that was our first time getting in trouble. And that instance uh, shifted my identity uh, pretty quickly into like, you know, that of being like, you know, a bad person. Like, you know, I'm, I like identified with being like stupid. Like I was like, I guess, you know, this, I'm just a fucked up kid. And yeah, yeah. so that kind of can like created this, uh, spiral down into that same story. And our use just got worse and it turned into, you know, from benzos and opiates pills to heroin and sometimes methamphetamine and um we got in trouble again he crashed his car i wasn't in the car but we decided to move to arizona to get away from 
you know, these charges and, you know, the bullshit world we were in, nobody gets us, nobody understands, yeah. <laughs> incomplete avoidance. Uh, yeah. And we moved to Arizona and things just like really took a turn for the worst. I, we were using, um, it was mostly heroin out there and um, I held two jobs while we were out there. Wow. And um, I was stripping at night dancing and uh, during the day I was working in a call center and using drugs. And it, it became harder and harder to hide. Um, we actually started buying, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of these, but there's like research benzodiazepines that you used to be able to buy online um, oh, wow. okay. called like flubromazolam and clonazolam. And um, it was liquid. Oof. And what would happen is you would take it and you would feel like you're not high. It's like these delusions of sobriety. So you take more. And um all of a sudden we're losing like weeks at a time. And um, yeah, I just like, it's in the realm of this level of drug addiction, it's impossible to not be getting in trouble. Like it's impossible to keep close relationships. It's impossible to keep a job. So inevitably, like we were just like in a place where we couldn't continue to live in Arizona. We were living with somebody who like was not cool with our drug use and was like, you got to get out. Um, so we moved back to Wisconsin and things got better for a minute. And then inevitably we both fell back into this substance abuse. Uh, and, um, it came down to this boiling point of, I was like living on my brother's floor, um, sleeping on a mattress. Like all I had was a mattress and a suitcase of my clothes and, um, I, I just like didn't have any lust for life. Like I didn't want to try. I didn't want to get a job. It was like, like from high school to this was when I was 21 years old. So 18 to 21, that had been my life. I had never learned how to actually survive or like keep a job or even like pay my bills on time. It was just like my next high is my priority. That's it. And, um, it was like my third month of living with my brother. It was October of 20, 2018. Yeah, 2018. And we um, we went to this park to meet with my friend. Uh, this was in Nino, Wisconsin. It was our friend and we were just gonna get high in the woods. And um, we had like Xanax, Oxycontin, a fentanyl patch and methamphetamine. And we were going to, I, there was something intuitively that I felt, I was like, I, I mean, I also logic uh, all of a sudden hit me at this point. I was like, I don't want to mix these drugs. It like, yeah. it feels like a mistake. Mm -hmm. So I like took a couple of Xanax and uh, that was it. And Alex, my prior partner and our friend, they, they kind of kept going. And um, yeah, so benzodiazepines and opiates and are, are like not meant to be combined. You know, downers and downers, absolutely not. Downers and uppers, absolutely not. Um, and they were just creating this cocktail. And eventually um, my partner, he was like nodding off and like it was starting to seem a little alarming, um, his state of consciousness. I was like, something's not right. And um, he wanted to go and get like an energy drink because he felt like if he were able to consume some caffeine, he'd be able to get himself out of this like faded state he was in. Um, so we went to this quick trip. And um, Alex was getting increasingly like unable to like stand up. And it's like, I, we just did not know what to do. And so I went inside to get some Red Bull and um, I think some candy. And I come out and he's on the ground. Um, he had overdosed. And that's, you know, what was happening the whole time. And um, I started to like black out. And in that process, uh, after the co or the ambulance had come to get him, me and my friend, I don't remember what happened next, but all of a sudden I'm at his house and I'm like, I came to for like 30 seconds to like us engaging sexually. Um, I, I didn't know it was happening, you know? So when I came out of that state, it was, uh, it was jarring. Alex was in the hospital. I had no idea what had happened. My friend you know, he told me that I like came on to him, but um, I was completely unconscious. So he raped me mm -hmm. and I went to the 
um, facility where Alex was. And I told him, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I, I don't want to die, you know? And so I like broke things off and I told him what happened with our friend and he didn't believe me and like ghosted me, cut me out for uh, about four months. And um, I entered just the, and I recognize it now as the most like transformative experience, but at the time it felt like I was going to die. Um, just this depression. I stopped using drugs. Uh, all I did was sleep and cry for like four months. And um, it was just like, that was my darkness. That was the darkest stage of my life. After going through these three and a half years and I gave you the nutshell version uh, yeah. with this man to have him abandon me after um, experiencing sexual assault from a close friend and watching him overdose. It was just like, it was just yeah. me in this experience. And um, on the other side of it, it was like um, on the other side of it and the three and a half years of drug use, like with this different clarity. Um, at first it was crushing, like this crushing weight of how am I going to build myself back up? Like what, what even is there, you know, cause this has been my life for so long and it was so fresh out of adolescence that um, I didn't even know what life could be. Um, and I did turn back to drugs on my own accord uh, a few times after, and eventually it came down to me getting an OWI in 2019. Um, I had been up for five days. I was smoking meth. I was dancing. I was just like trying to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. And um, I didn't know how to like connect with other people. So it was just me and me pretty much. And um, I got an OWI and I got my license taken away and I continued to drive and I got caught a couple of times driving without my license. <laughs> and here I am sitting in a holding cell and um, they had me on. I was actually sober this time. I was actually I was with Alex. He had arrived at my home really fucked up. And I was like, no, we're not doing this. I'll drive you home. And we got pulled over like a block away from his house. Uh, again, I feel it was divine timing. And um, they found LSD in his car and they tried to pin me with it. Mm. Um, and uh, it, I think, okay, Alex was running from some felony charges. And I think that they manipulated me by telling me that he said the drugs were mine. Uh, we got it clear that he never said that. Uh, and they, I think they were just trying to get me to say, yeah, you know, those drugs are his. So they had a reason to ah, take him yep. in. Gotcha. Uh, which, yeah. Um, little sidestep, but, um, uh, while I was sitting in the holding cell, um, I just, I felt, you know, I was, I had cried so much and I just felt, I was like, what is it going to be? You know, is it going to be like, it, it felt like the choice I had left was between life and death. Like it's either I choose to change or like I'm going to like die, you know, essentially, whether that be literally or, or otherwise. And I made a promise to myself. I was like, I'm going to do it different when I get out of here. And then came the outpatient treatment program that I was talking about earlier. I was also utilizing uh, psilocybin. Um, I was microdosing it. Um, as I was getting off of um, benzos and opiates in particular, those are the ones that stuck with me. And um, I, I think plant medicine is super powerful. Um, I also recognized that like, I didn't know shit about integration when I was microdosing it. So like I was having all these really impactful thoughts and like profound awarenesses around my addiction, but like I didn't necessarily implement the lessons automatically as most people don't um, right out the gate. So that's kind of like a little nutshell of where I, I came from. And um, once I got far enough away from it, and that's what it takes, uh, is getting far enough away from it. And um, I found myself within the most beautiful community, uh, seemingly out of nowhere. Um, like people who were coming together to like dress up in onesies and like meditate together. And um, I didn't even know that that level of like play and fun existed, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. Play and fun to me was like, you know, we're going to mm. get high. Like that was yeah, it. And yeah. 
when I experienced that, it was just like this uh, light bulb came on and, and um, I got a taste of like what, what is really possible. And like to know that there are people out there who, uh, who just, that's what they do. They play and they connect and um, that became the fuel. And um, I stayed within this community. And for a long time, I wasn't able to let that level of love and connection penetrate me. You know, I had closed my heart for so long that to let that in felt scary. But I would still sit in the same rooms, whether I was silent or not, I was there and um, watching. I, I felt like I was the observer for um, the first two years I was in Milwaukee. Um, just like seeing what was possible, but not necessarily participating as much and um I would say that the most uh when when the change like really started to become tangible within me was very recently like um last year on April 1st I I had I had found myself stuck in another pattern not one of addiction necessarily to substance Mm. but addiction to safety and Mm. addiction to like comfort and for sureness. Um, I was in a relationship that, you know, it was really solid, lacked passion. Um, I didn't feel hurt a lot. Uh, I didn't feel that I could express myself. And I, I recognize now that was me limiting me, but, um, I was in this unsatisfying relationship and I also was working a job. I had kept it for two years, which was a major feat for me. Mm-hmm. And it was starting to feel stagnant. And um, I was starting to feel like I wanted to do something new. I wanted to start coaching and I wanted to start just like exploring. And um, yeah, my partner now, Bill, he asked me to be on his podcast. And it was the first time I'd been on a podcast. And um, the podcast was about my coaching business. And um, it was the first time I had spoken like that about myself and about what I cared about. And it just opened up this whole new world for me. And so did our connection in general. Um, I was able to like level with him and like process things on a new level. I I felt seen and heard in a way deeper than I ever had before. And it made it impossible to return to my job or my relationship and know that I wasn't able to receive the same level of depth. So it's interesting to reflect on like um, while I was using drugs, I was numbing out that depth. I was numbing out my aliveness and it turned into me just wanting to continue to expand into it. Like all I needed was that little taste of connect, like deep connection and community to like begin the process of bursting forward and, and changing the way that I was perceiving my reality and the way that I was interacting with it. And um, yeah, so a year ago, exactly this time, I decided to live alone for the first time and start to cultivate uh, my strength and my safety from within. Uh, And it was, yeah, it was a beautiful and profound experience. I have been talking for a long time. Mm. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, it's beautiful. I, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all that. It is a, it's an amazing, I mean, amazing. It's words can't necessarily touch it, you know, on the negation acknowledged, like that's, uh, that is an amazing story. And like you say, it's, that's a nutshell. I mean, you could, that that could be a two or three hours of very specifics going into some granular detail of stories that I'm fairly certain would be like jaw dropping stories, right. Of things that you've been through, experienced, forgotten, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, thanks for just for the honesty and, and uh and yeah, what a what a, what an origin story. So I, I just want to reflect that back to you before I, I follow up with any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's yeah, it's so fun to to see what comes up and comes out. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So it's and it sounds like so you're about a year into this like new life, new way of living. Uh, from what you'd mentioned, um, you know, it's just nice that you know like. I believe that like when people are open to change the right people in the right situations start coming to them, you know, it's like a gift from the universe or or however you may look at it. So it sounds like there was a degree of that for you as well. Whereas like there had been so long of, of, um, you know, this, yeah, this darkness, as you mentioned, or this kind of, kind of confused state that you were in as far as like, I'm sure that that person that you are right now that I'm talking to was in there. It was just so 
distorted and and uh, layered with all these different substances and such. And then so for you to be able to have that aha moment, like when you're in the holding cell and then be greeted, uh, you know, have that reflected to you from the external. And like, I'm, I'm, that's just, yeah, beautiful thing. So that was a really, really powerful part of the story. Uh, I, I dev, was definitely getting emotional uh, hearing you say it. So, uh, so thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's just one of those stories I was just listening to, I riveted, and now, you know, coming out of it, I, I don't necessarily have any uh, follow-up questions, which is rare for me. I usually have, oh, okay, I'll have those three topics, so um, take that as a compliment as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's so fascinating that you're coming out the other side, you found these communities, you're about a year into this, uh, you know, journey of expansion and, and self-discovery. What are some of the biggest uh, takeaways for you now, as far as like, you know, let's start with yourself. Like what, how do you view yourself now that you're a year, a year in what, what do you, what is your coaching business and you having your story come out like this, coming on podcasts like this, what does that say about you now? I love that question. Um, Ram Das has this meditation and it talks about, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but it talks about um, how each of us have this fire inside of us. And sometimes our fire becomes like more of an ember that you have to dig for, but it's there, you know, everybody has it. And what has to happen is we fan that ember and that's all that's important is that ember. Um, and I love that meditation because it's so true. And, um, when I was within my addiction, it was like, I didn't recognize the power that I held, you know, mm. and I didn't recognize the power that anybody held. I felt completely powerless because I was extra extricating. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, giving my power away. Yes. Yeah. To these substances. Um, and once I removed the substances, it was like, I got to experience the almost the fear of my power um Ooh. next which i yeah. still experience sometimes like the fear of my power being the fear of responsibility the mm. the fear of having control like mm -hmm. the fear that it is in my hands and now yeah. i have this just the more i stuck with that and i have become my new addiction is to put myself into situations that i'm afraid of yeah. Yeah. Like it went from, you know, avoiding my fear to like just running headfirst into it because I know that there's something to learn there. There's something to be taught. Like there's, yes. there's some way that I get to find a way to play in this, mm -hmm. in this scenario that's making me afraid, whether that be jumping onto a podcast mm -hmm. with you know, somebody I've never met before <laughs> or, yeah. um, reaching out to a stranger wanting to connect who like I recognize in the community is doing cool shit like and then going and meeting them like or you know getting on stage or facilitating a workshop or I, there's so many ways to play and um, that reframe is one of the greatest gifts I've given myself is like just how can I find a way to play in this scenario yeah. Um, yeah. because that there's so you in every conversation, there's just, there's ways to poke at um, the experience and find like new ways to engage with other people. And um, yeah, uh, a main take, a major takeaway has been um, my now, like just constant desire to be connecting with new people in what, however mm. I can, like, yeah. you know, with questioning, like, you know, in, in coaching containers, it's all about the questions you ask. And I love that tool just in normal day-to-day -day mm. conversations, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, how are you? No, no. Like <laughs> there's so many cooler questions to ask. Like, yes. like what is bringing you the most passion right now? Um, or like yeah. even a, a fun one, like, what is your favorite way to play? And like how many adults even use the word play? Um, yeah, good point. Very good point. I love that. Yeah, the uh, the reframing, which as we know, you know, and anybody that listens to my show knows of the this, at least a, a you know, 10,000 foot view of story work and in lifted and language and the power of words and such. I had heard a quote, um, I think it was Mel Robbins said it, where it's like, you know, fear and excitement show up 
the same in mm. your body. It's all about how you're processing it mentally. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Now you're looking at it as play and the fear has now become this excitement, or at least there's like that fluctuation that you can play with, right? And in, in that sense, which is really cool. So that's very inspiring. Um, yeah, Beth, this has been a great conversation. I want to give you uh, an opportunity to let people know, as as you're mentioning, you're liking connecting with people. So I'd love to give you the opportunity to let people know where to find you online. I know you have a podcast going on. So yeah, the floor is yours. Where What's the easiest way to reach out to you if uh, somebody listening is interested in getting a hold of you? Beautiful. Um, yeah, my Instagram currently is the best way. Um, I don't have a website yet, uh, but my my handle is EF integrations underscore coaching. And my podcast is called ebb and flow sessions on Spotify. Mm. And yeah, um, I love voice messaging. So if you want to connect over Instagram and, and back and forth, have a conversation. I love that. Um, always down to talk to other like-hearted humans who are doing the thing doing whatever their thing is yeah yeah exactly i mark england got us all on the uh the voice to text didn't he yeah i i, I enjoy that as well <laughs> very cool so that's so that's the the key to your uh communication is uh send send you a voice text noted awesome yeah and i'll be checking out your podcast and yeah i'd love to as we talked about before maybe uh per, soft talk acknowledged uh, might be the an, an, one of your next guests who knows right so yeah uh, Beth, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, is there, if there's any uh, final words, just, you know, if somebody, I always like to say, if somebody's sort of on the fence or, uh, you know, getting a little, like a little bit hesitant about taking that so, sober journey, you know, sober curious, whatever it may look like for them. Um, yeah, just a little bit of advice to those types, the, the, maybe the, indec the uh, indecisive type. Uh, what would be your, your advice? One small change at a time. Um, mm. There have been so many times where I've been like, I'm going to cut out everything right. at the same time. And it's like just this recipe for self-sabotage and feeling really bad about myself. So even if you can like set aside a couple days a week to abstain from things, mm. um, that's that's worked the best for me. And it's helped me form different types of relationships with different substances. I still interact with cannabis. I still interact with tobacco and um, I still interact with psilocybin. And um, what I've been able to gain from giving myself the spaciousness from these things and then returning to them with intention, that's like the main thing. Like if complete sobriety isn't for you, then I would recommend like, you know, if it, if this resonates to like sit with the the medicine and reframe it as a medicine because it can be utilized as a tool mm -hmm. and asking what it has to show you or like putting like with cannabis, I like to interact with it and be like, you know, my intention is to be creative, to move my emotions and be with them and to turn it into some sort of art. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, they, there's so many ways to bring your power back to you and not be like seeking out power or um, seeking out avoidance with these substances. Like you're safe to be with your emotions. You're safe to be with your experience and you can utilize substances as tools and gifts. Um, and that, you know, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love it. That's a great way to, uh, we'll put the pin in it for now. I foresee a part two at some point, I'm going to put this out there right now. There's still so much that we can talk about. Uh, that was felt like very much uh, getting to know you, the origin story. There's so many different topics that we can riff on, I'm sure. So I'm going to throw that out there right now. I'd love to have you back on for a part two at some point. So Beth, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. And I'm in. <laughs>